Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, Jerusalem's the capital, but Israel always has been Amen. God's land. Amen. It never did belong to anybody else. So. Uh, but we're glad that our president has recognized it. Amen. <clears throat> Before we, you can turn this down just a little bit, I believe. I think you can hear me okay. Um, I don't even talk this loud to my wife, so... But uh, you are, uh, yeah. But you haven't heard her talk to me. But I don't. <laughs> I've got something I got today. I was going through some things for tonight, kind of getting some things together, and I came across something that I got several years ago. It's a little item, and I, I wanted to, the pastor to hear this because this is for him. So when he gets done there, that's fine. Um, I think it's okay. Don't worry about. But, Pastor, this is what I want to give to you and read to you and your wife and for the whole church, for that matter. But uh, uh, I guess being a pastor, this kind of, I know what it means. Miracles happen every Sunday through our church. Attendance at church last Sunday was mighty poor. I don't reckon I ought to grumble because I had a bunch of six members. And when you add to all that my shut-ins, we don't have a site of pew fillers. So I went ahead and preached to what I had. Only thing was, the echo in the near-empty church hurt my ears. My wife said I need to go out and drive a while and let the fresh air clear my head, and, and it done the trick. Our little ride not only cleared my head, it made me feel right good inside. What I saw made me rejoice. I saw miracle after miracle. Old Hezekiah, uh, old Hezekiah, who was deathly sick that very morning, had roused up and was riding down the highway with his fishing poles. Nothing but a miracle could have rescued old Hez from the jaws of death in such a short time. Now there's Ruth's brother. Ruth told me Sunday morning that his brother's back was in foul shape, and they were afraid an operation was going to be necessary. We remembered him in our prayers, and lo and behold, at 2 p.m., there he stood at the driving range hitting golf balls. If that wasn't a quick recovery, I don't know what is. All told, about 20 of my sick folk were, had roused and were taking nourishment in one form or another. But what really made me happy was to see so, ma so many of my shut-ins out riding around and enjoying the world. Hezekiah's pa, who don't, at who don't attend church because he can't stand crowds, was headed for the drag races. Sister Nell's mama, who was too weak to get out of the house, was in town shopping. Ellie Nykeslinger's sister, who can't come on account of her kidneys, stood in line two hours to get into the show. It was a show about the miracle worker. I thought it was right appropriate, seeing how a miracle had happened to her. Yes, sir, it thrilled my heart to see what I saw. And I ought to have a packed house next Sunday with all my sick folk being healed. And the shut-ins set free. I just hope they don't overdo themselves before next Sunday and have a relapse. <laughs> Amen. I, I've been there. Amen. I remember as a pastor here in the state, not here, but in another city, and we were restarting a church. And Sunday morning, we had a, we'd had a good crowd. We were really excited. And God, it, I had a message. I was all ready to, to preach Sunday night and got to church. And the only ones that showed up was my wife and our kids and one other lady and her boy. That morning, we had probably 50 people or a little more. And that night, it was just that. And uh, that really makes you get down and pray. <laughs> Amen. Found out where some were. Some were out at the lake water skiing. And some others would just doing their thing. But uh, the other lady that came, her dad was a Pentecostal holiness preacher uh, in another city, and uh, so she knew something. She got on the phone and I guess read some of them the riot act because next Sunday they were all there <laughs> to church. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to begin talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We have been. And um, this is such a subject that as I, I, I get into it, I'm not going to 
preach like I might normally preach. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to emphasize the importance that we as Assemblies of God must have and must strive to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me say something, and I might raise some, raise some eyebrows. I'm not charismatic. I'm Pentecostal. Now you got quiet. There's a difference. Charismatics enjoy the emotionalism, and so do I, and so do you. But Pentecostals are into the Word. That is the difference. I got that from Jack Aford. So you want to argue with this scholar from the West Coast. And so I, I believe uh, in, in what the Charismatics do, but uh, we're not in so involved in uh, just emotion, but we must have the Word of God. We must have God's Word. Amen. Paul said to Timothy, preach the Word. Amen. And so we, we need to uh, have the Word of God. And Jesus said, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be equipped. And that word equipped, I believe Pastor brought it out last week, means clothed. In other words, you're clothed with the presence of God. You're clothed in his presence. You're clothed with his anointing. You're clothed with his power. And he said, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued or clothed or filled with power. And in Acts 1, 8 said, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Amen. I'm going to try not preach, okay? But we need to understand that as a Pentecostal. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't change being Pentecostal for anything. Amen. And I believe the church today, what we're doing is stressing there needs to be in the church an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Uh, an outpouring, a flowing of God's power and presence and the anointing of God's presence, the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. The church needs a Holy Ghost anointing. Now, I'm not talking about one church. I'm talking about the assemblies of God. I have been in it all my life. I have been a minister here for 54 years. I know and I've seen, and there needs to be a fresh anointing of God's Holy Ghost. Amen. A fresh anointing of the power of God. A fresh anointing of the Spirit of God. A fresh anointing of the manifestation of the power of God. A fresh anointing of His anointing. A fresh anointing of some enthusiasm that will thrill us and strengthen us. And God said, I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. I'm going to fill you with the power of God. Now, let me say this. Tongues is not the baptism. It's the evidence that you have received. For they spake with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And we need to have a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and you haven't sp spoken tongues in a while, your tanks went dry. You need to be refilled with the power of God. Amen. You know, we, we stress this, and it's right to speak in tongues and get filled. But we gotta tell, i got to tell you something. Once you get filled with the Holy Ghost, your life is changed. Amen. There's something that happens, amen, in your life, and all of a sudden there's a fresh anointing. Something is ministering unto you. And so we need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We need the anointing of God's presence that will minister unto us and flow upon us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't, don't go to sleep on me, all right? Now, now listen. Jesus said you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Joel tells us in the last days I will pour out my spirit. When's the last days? The day of Pentecost. From then on has been the last days. He said in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now in the Old Testament it was only on a few. But in the New Testament, it's for everybody. Amen. Now, I, I, you'll have to excuse sometimes, but to get my point across, I use some experiences because I've been there, done that, and did that, so I know. Pastoring a church once, we had a couple come into church, an older couple, and I was pastoring a, a, an Assembly of God church in Michigan, and they needed to have a fire lit under them. I mean to tell you what. Every time I'd light a fire, they'd blow it out. So... So I, um, this couple came in the church one Sunday morning, didn't know who they were. They'd moved into the town, and they saw the, the Assembly of God church. And so they came to church that morning, and he, he, he shouted. And they hadn't had shouting in that church in a long time, and he shouted. 
And I mean, some necks almost got broke because they twisted around to see who's making that noise. Uh, you know, and they got filled. And so I went and saw him one day and, and to visit with him because I was like, happy he was there. You know, and uh, so when I went to see him, he told me what church he came out of. It was a fundamental church, but they didn't believe in the baptism. And the elders went to the church, to his home, and told him that he had to leave the church unless he recounted speaking in tongues. And says he, because they said, that's of the devil, brother. You, you can't have that. And he said, I, you know what I told him, Pastor? He said, if it's of the devil, why do I feel so good? <laughs> Amen. Because I'll tell you what, you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you let God use you, it's going to do something in your life. Amen. You're going to, all of a sudden, you're going to be filled and you're going to be excited. Amen. You're going to have the presence of God. And, you know, you, there are people going to come. I always like what Charles Wesley, I think it was Charles or John Wesley said. I've used it. It's one of my favorite sayings. One of the, anyways, one of the Wesleys said this. When you catch on fire, people will come and watch you burn. They'll come. Fire draws. Fire brings attention, and people uh, will come and watch you burn. He didn't mean a physical burn. He meant they'll come and see what's going on. Amen. They'll come to the church. Amen. I'm going down to that church. Some will stay. Some won't. But uh, that, that, don't worry about that. We're just, we're just going to, I believe, that Lakeside, and I, I, I believe this with all my heart. God didn't put this church in. This went through some problems in the past. That's gone. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling in Jesus Christ. But I believe that there's a, that two, 2018, if we'll pray and believe God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and get baptized in the Holy Ghost or the evidence of speaking with other tongues, there can be a, a revival that will fill this church. Amen. People will come. Amen. They're not going to, it isn't always going to be the preaching that's going to bring them. The preaching has a part, but it's going to be the presence of God. I'm trying to get the baptism in here like I had it planned, but it didn't work. In. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is very important. Jesus said, you might, to have it, go and get it. Baptized means immersed. When you baptize somebody in water, we don't sprinkle them. We baptize them and we immerse them. In other words, we, 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 we immerse them, we put them, we put them under. Amen. I had a lady one time got baptized, and she was about five foot tall and about five foot wide. I mean, she was, she was a great lady. She loved God. But she had never been, she'd been baptized. She'd saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. God used her in the church. But she said, Pastor, I've never been baptized. So I said, well, okay. So we had a baptismal service, put her in the water. I always, I, God, things come. And Pastor, when I put her down under, her feet popped up. So I had her head down and her feet out. And baptized her in the name of Jesus. Amen. But it's an immersion. Filling them with the power of God. The immersion. And when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're going to be immersed in his presence. Immersed in his power. Immersed in his anointing. The church needs today. And I'm not a negative preacher, but I know what I know and I've seen what I see. We need a fresh anointing of God's Holy Ghost. Amen. Doctor, we need a glory. And I wasn't going to preach. Pastor, I'm sorry. <laughs> We need, what? Go ahead, <laughs> but, well, I won't double clutch. I'll just. <laughs> but God wants us to have a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, baptized. And if you haven't, you've been baptized and you haven't spoken tongues, you need to get back to the tank. You need to get back to the, the, the pump and, and let God refill you again. Amen. You're filled once, but you can be refilled many times. Amen. And you can get, get a fresh anointing that will affect your life. I, I, I want to read something to you that I, I, some of these things I've had for a long time, but this is, uh, was done by Dr. Dobbins. And you, you people don't know who Dr. Dobbins was, but at one time he was, a, uh, he's not going to be the Lord, but he had emerged ministries. But he spoke at the general uh, headquarters in the general presbyter meeting uh, there, and they have a spiritual emphasis week every week. And this is what he said. 
Dr. Dobbins urged our fellowship to allow the mind of Christ to possess our lives in order to reveal to us the necessity of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it's in its activity and to the gifts of the Spirit and their manifestation, which are greatly needed in the church today. Now, this is over 10 years old, this article. He spoke with urgency that we must not allow the laudation spirit of this generation to rob us of our significant experience of spirit baptism, which is an, which is an experience, an expression of speaking in tongues as the spirit gives utterance. We need that today. We need it. When we minister effectively in the Holy Spirit, God, something will happen. One of our church planners, and I don't, I don't know the man, but he's been successful in church planning. And someone asked him one time, what, what is your method? How do, what is your program? How do you do things in your church? How do you go into a place and get a church and grow it to be a large church? How do you do it? In other words, they were thinking for some ideas and some, uh, you know, they, some way you do it. You know, how, how do you do it, you know? We've been to the service places where they try to tell you how to do it, do things, you know. And uh, I got so I didn't go to them because when I when I left, I said, "My Lord, according to them, I don't do anything right." And then when I found out that one was telling us how to grow our church and he didn't pastor, never pastored a church, I thought, "That's it." And so, but this church planner said this. He said. What, what, what's your, what's your, uh, how do you do it? You know, they, they were figuring he does this and he does that and so forth. He says, it's amazing what will happen when you let Jesus in. It's amazing what will happen when you let Jesus in. Amen. Amen. We come on Sunday morning, we come to a nice building, but we come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We come to hear the preaching, but we also come to hear what God has for us. The power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's so vital and so important. And, and, and God uh, told the church, the early church, what they must do. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, not everybody's going to accept it, but that's fine. I learned a long time ago, if I tried to plead everybody all the time, I'd have a nervous breakdown. All believing are entitled to and should seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This lady I talked about whose feet popped up when I put her head down under. Yet it was, it was funny. When, 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 you know, I, you couldn't put her feet down because it just pop up like a cork. But I had her head under that. So God. But we must have the presence of God and the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that will minister unto us. We must be filled with God's Holy Spirit and whole and presence in the baptism and should seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was a normal experience in the early church. A pastor friend of mine one time got, was getting people saved. He says, Pat Darwin, he said, I'm getting them saved and they're getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. I, before they left the altar, I said, well, what are you doing? I mean, how are you doing? He said, when they get saved, I tell them about Pentecost. When they get saved, I tell them about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this lady, that her, her feet went up here in the water. But she couldn't understand why people prayed for the baptism. And I said to her one day, I said, well, sister, why? I mean, she said, because on the night I got saved, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit before I left the altar. So she got both in one night. She got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and later on baptized in water. I mean, she couldn't understand it. But I said, well, that's the way it, it happens. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need to have one. What is the baptism? We need to understand the Holy Spirit. I've got so much here. i got next week too, haven't I? Okay. I'll tell you what, this is a sermon. This you can spend a long time on. The person of the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you the experience is distinct from the new birth. We won't have time for all the scriptures, but I'll give them to you in Acts 8. We find if you go to the book of Acts, notice that. Follow with me, please.
The groundwork for the, the, the early church is still the same groundwork for the church today is found in the book of Acts. What changed that church was the Holy Ghost outpouring that filled them. And when they came out of that upper room, they weren't 120 men uh, that loved God, but they were 120 men charged with the Holy Ghost. There were 120 that were filled with God's Holy Spirit. Notice in Acts, we find there that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. The Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, remember this, remember this, the Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a person. This experience is distinct from the new birth. There's a change. If you go into the book of Acts, you find that in Acts chapter 8. Uh, we see it there. In chapters, uh, verse, in chapter 8, verse 12 through 17, we won't read the whole thing, but you notice there that when they spoke about it, I've got to slow down a little bit here. In Acts chapter 8, we find there <coughs> that they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Got the wrong page. Chapter 8, notice what it says there in verses 12 through 17. But when you heard that there was a corn, that's the wrong one. But anyways, in chapter 8, just mark it down. We'll find there it talks about the Holy Spirit, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit in those days. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes such an experience as an overflowing fullness of the Spirit. Why did God choose tongues? Why? You want to know what I feel? Because the tongue is the most unruly part of the body. Amen. James talks about the tongue. And I'm going to read that because this is important. You speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives you utterance. Words come to your mind that you don't understand. You just say them. They might sound silly, but you say them. And when you do, God begins to take over. Amen. You know, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, of course, back in those days, you'd tarry around the altar, and I don't know if you ever had it. Maybe Tim might have, uh, being with Jack Carroll, uh, knowing Jack, hang on, brother. Let go, brother. You found yourself out in limbo someplace trying to, not knowing what to do. God, please fill me with the Holy Ghost because I don't know which way I'm going here. Hang on, let go. They met well because some was, just, just don't let go, Pastor. Don't let go, brother. Hang on. And and I was at camp meeting those days. We used to have camp meetings. And I was at camp meeting, and my wife was praying, and I was praying, and I wanted the baptism so bad. And I'd get so close. And so one night, we was at camp meeting, and my wife, and I'm praying, and my wife's praying, and this big preacher came along. He was tall. I mean, his, he could use a, baseball, a basketball like a baseball in his hand. I mean, he was huge. I don't mean this way, but just... And uh, I remember him asking my wife, I'm praying. She says, what does he want? She said, my wife crying says he wants the, he wants the Holy Ghost. And, and this, my, this is how I was baptized. Pastor, he just put his head, I remember putting his hand on my head, like to drove me through the sawdust floor uh, and pushed me down. He said, fill him with the Holy Ghost and walked away. And immediately, I'll tell you what, I was filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And can I tell you something? I've been speaking in tongues since. And that was over 58 years ago. I want you to know something. This walk with God talk is something else. Amen. I'll tell you what, when you get saved, you're a new creation in Christ. But when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you are again a new person in Christ because there's something in your life that's changed. And all of a sudden, not only am I saved, but I've got the power of God. I've got the anointing. There's something about it. Amen. The anointing of God uh, will break the yoke uh, and it will bless you. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We need the power of God in this day and age. We cannot waver. We cannot waver like some are doing and stand upon the word of God and believe God. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you what. 
This isn't going according to my outline. What? <laughs> Maybe. But notice it says here that an overflowing of the fullness of the Spirit, a deepened reverence for God will happen when you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's not just an emotional thing, although it is, but it will change your life. It will change your life. Let me say this, and I, I'm grateful for it here. But we do have a few churches that if you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, go down to room to something, and you, they'll pray for you down there. That bothers me, Pastor, because people need to see it. When somebody's baptized in the Holy Spirit, it needs to be an evidence to others what is happening and they say they're being filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. They're being filled with God's Holy Ghost. And, and, and they get up from that and they know what's happened. Amen. I had a lady one time, she got saved. She said, I'm, I, I'm saved, Pastor, and I'm excited about that. But she said, this tongue stuff that your church does isn't for me. She kept coming to church. And she was the first convert in our church as a young pastor and the first one to receive the baptism. Because when she received it, the whole town knew it. I mean, she was louder than a, than a foghorn. I'll tell you what. She just let people know. Changed her life. And when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, it's going to change you. That's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. The Assemblies of God believe in that. You've got to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, you're not, you, you don't need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. You've got to be saved. But you need to have this to give you an overcoming life. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That you go and you walk with God. And in times of going through a valley, you just get alone with God and let the power of God come and minister unto you. You following me tonight? And just let the power of God. I'll tell you what, it'll change your life. You'll see things happen in your prayer life. With the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it will change you. You look into Acts 2, into the first part of Acts, when they came out of that upper room, they prayed for 10 days. What does the Holy Spirit do to us? Well, when number one, it teaches us. That's why it's important to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some fail to realize the Holy Spirit is a person. In John 14, 15, and 16, it refers to the Holy Spirit as he or him. We know the Spirit is a person because of the names given in the Bible. In John 14, 26, he teaches In Acts 8, 39, he guides. He guides. And, num and then also in Romans 8, 26, you need to write these down if you're taking notes. It helps you to pray. And then it reveals to us the things of God that we need to know, understand the scriptures we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The only way to receive the Holy Ghost, baptism in the Holy Spirit, is to speak in unknown tongues, a heavenly language. You need to learn when you use it, to use it as you pray. It's a prayer language that will help you when you're praying, will strengthen you, and you see, when you pray in tongues, you know what? The devil doesn't know what you're saying. He cannot understand heavenly language. And so when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us all about this. In Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11, it said, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his, this people. In John 44, 3, he said, and listen to me, I will pour water upon him, which is the Holy Spirit, that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, and I'll pour, here it is, excuse me, and I will pour my spirit upon that, your seed, 
and my blessing upon thine offspring. You're thirsty tonight. Are you thirsty for the Holy Ghost? Are you thirsty to see a manifestation of the Spirit of God? Are you thirsty for a fresh anointing and a refreshed filling? As Pentecostals, I, I believe in emotion. I believe that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, something's going to happen. But you need to be a church. You see, we believe in that, but along with that comes healing and other things that we could that we talked about later on. But I want you to know something. It reveals to us the deep things of God. And you will speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. It will change you. It will change your church. Now, this is maybe a little different, but it will change your church because you're the church. It will change your church because it's changing you when you come to church. The Bible says, know you not that you're a temple of the Holy Ghost. It will change it. It'll change your church and make it a church full of God's power. You'll have to excuse me because I'm talking from experience pastor so if that's okay <laughs> some of you've heard this before but when we went into ministry long long time ago the church we pastored was our home church and when we went into the church it was in such turmoil that we didn't realize so much that it was but the people asked us to come and uh, I didn't have credentials yet. I had applied but did not have them. And the district okayed the board to let me be the pastor. But when I walked in, came to church, and I realized that the church was split, but nobody left. This group here would not talk to this group over here. And this group over here would not talk to this group here. And if there was a group sitting over there, they wouldn't talk to anybody either. But we came. God sent us, and we began to pray. God began to, we began, in spite of that, we began to see growth. And then I got in contact. Or somebody told me about a man from Canada. And I'll never forget his name. His name was Klingsman. He's a big, tall guy. Assembly of God out of Canada. Of course, we lived in Michigan, so he didn't have to come far. He came to the church, and in those days, you had two-week revivals. How many here remember two-week revivals? <laughs> and the first week, he preached on the Holy Ghost and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. People came to the altar and prayed, and we didn't see uh, many soul savers. You aren't going to see too many with that kind of a attitude, but we did see growth. Some people came back and so forth. But anyways, the next week, the second week, Tim, he preached on the power and the need to have the Holy Ghost. The first week he set the pattern. He set the blueprint. In the second week he preached and God moved. And that church was filled with the Holy Ghost. There were those that never, like this lady, who had never spoken tongues before. There were others that got baptized anew and afresh. It changed the church. I mean, all of a sudden, these people were loving those people. Those people were loving these people. Everybody was loving together. And there became a Holy Ghost outpouring. And people began to come to the church. Not, in, not like it's not that Brownsville or anything, but people began to come. Yeah, they'd come. And there was a mighty move of God. <clears throat> when people get hungry, and there were those baptized in the Holy Ghost, and others were refilled and fresh and anew, and the church became spirit-filled. 
when the Holy Spirit moves, something's going to happen, but we've got to let him do it. We have got to let him do it. I learned some things as a young pastor. Another one was, there were some people came one Sunday night to hear me preach because I went to, I went to high school with them in that same city. My wife and I went to the same high school. And there were these, they came, they wanted to come and see what had happened to Doc Bostwick was true. They wanted to know. I went to a reunion, and every time I'd go to a high school reunion and listen, I'm trying to get a point across, they'd always ask me to pray. They knew that I was a minister. But one of the men at the last reunion that I prayed, and he got up and said, when people told me, and I was told that Doc, and they used to call me Doc, Doc Bostwick was saved, he said, there's no way. Can't happen. He said, not, no, no, not him. But he said, but now I believe. I see in these years. An outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And these, these, these family came. I'm going to lay a point. And they came. I was going to teach and I'm preaching. All right. And when I saw them come in the door, our church was really hopping because people filled the Holy Spirit. But that night I said, I learned a lesson, and I think it will help us as pastor. I said in those days the pastor would sit on the platform. And my song leader, they didn't call them praise and worship, and they were song leaders. We, we, in those days we used, you know, it's what you call the book, the hymnal. <laughs> and um, I saw them come in. And this is what I prayed on. God taught us, listen to me. He said, God, I spoke and I said, God, this lady that I baptized, she was a real war, uh, prayer warrior. God used her in, in, in the gifts. And I said, Lord, please don't let the song leader lead us in any fast songs tonight because these people were not Pentecostal. They were from a, a church, but it was a good church. But they, I said, oh, just let everything be so good. And I said, please don't let Sister Banks, her name was, speak in tongues. Because every time she'd get ready to speak in tongues, she would go, whoop, whoop. I didn't stop it, you know. I didn't want to hurt nothing. But if you were worshiping the Lord and God was moving, you'd hear whoop. You know something was going to happen. I said, please don't let Sister Banks speak in tongues. Let everything be done decently in order. Now, here's a, a pastor who just uh, prayed for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and God moving. But these were people from, you know, they wanted to, they, you know, didn't want to, they didn't hurt their feelings. Well, you know what happened. The song leader got up. The first song he sang on her feet, he said, I'll fly, the song was, I'll fly away. Fast. Every song he got out of the songbook that night was fast. And you know what happened? In the midst of all that, Sister Banks went, whoop. And she gave a message interpretation. And I got up and preached, and I'm seething in my spirit, Pastor. And I said, God, didn't you hear me? Didn't you hear me? So I got up and preached at the end of the service. We went back to talk to him. We hadn't seen him in a while. And I'll never forget the one lady who we went to high school with. She was talking to me. And she says, Doc, she said, we really enjoyed the service. She said, your preaching was okay. But she said, we really enjoyed the service. Did you get it? They enjoyed the presence of the Lord. Can I tell you from that day on, when I walked from the back of the church up the aisle, I asked God to forgive me. And I said, never again. Never again will I ask anything. Never again. We're going to have a move, of God. And in my ministry, Pastor and yours, that's what I want more than anything. 
I, I, I'm not interested in all the fanfare, but I am interested in the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Ghost that will minister unto us, that when people come in the church, they will know and they can sense the presence of God. And they'll know that there's something happening here. Pastor talked about the man down at Brownsville. I heard that same story where the man walked out, said there's something in there. So he's walking with his back against the wall because he's scared to death. But it was the presence and the power of God. Amen. When people come in our church, there needs to be the presence of God that will minister unto them. We'll know that we have been with Jesus. Amen. We've been in the presence of God. When we're filled with the Holy Ghost and we're letting God minister unto us, and the anointing of the God is here, and he's going to, if he's on us, he's in this building. And when they come in, they're going to sense the presence of God and the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And things will happen, Pastor. In 2018, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not just prophesying. I'm standing upon God's word that if we'll stand upon it and get filled with the Holy Ghost in 2018, how with the evidence of speaking with other tongues and the power of God and the anointing of God, I'm here to tell you something's going to happen and there's going to be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. People are going to come in and say, I want to hear and see what's happening at Lakeside. Amen. And as we reach out to them, they'll know they've been in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. That God will be the power of the Holy Spirit. It isn't just to make you feel good. It's to give you strength and to minister on to you and to give you the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, give the church in these days a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, I didn't get to tongues. Did I get to, to James? If you read it, why did he choose tongues? Because even so, in Acts, uh, James 3, verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts us great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it, set, and it is set on fire of hell. Every, every kind of beasts and birds and serpents and the things of the sea tamed and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly, evil, deadly of poison. Notice that, what James says is the tongue. Why did God choose tongues? Because once he gets your tongue, he's got you. Because from the tongue, James was on to say, from the tongue is cursing and blessing. So when God gets this, that's why he uses the tongue, that we can be filled with the Holy Ghost and with the anointing of the presence of God and the power of God. Let God minister on to us today. And let us have the power of the Lord. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We're living in that day when God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. And we need it in our church. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the anointing of God. For in Isaiah, it says the anointing breaks the yoke. The power of God will break the oak, the presence of God. The assemblies of God were founded upon the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We have no specific leader like some churches did, some organizations. Just a group got together in 1914 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, men and women that were filled with the Holy Ghost and realized they needed to come together and have an organization so things would continue to go and not go astray. Out of that became the Assemblies of God. Today is the Assemblies of God were the largest Pentecostal movement in the world with 67 or 68 million members around worldwide. I'm saying all this, say this. It didn't come by a program. It didn't come by some eloquent preacher. It came from men and women filled with the Holy Ghost who got together and said, 
We want this. And out of that meeting came what we know today as the General Council of the Assemblies of God. I'm proud to be a member of the Assemblies of God. But more important than that, I'm proud to be part of the kingdom of God. To be filled with the Holy Ghost and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm proud to say to you tonight, I'm filled with the power of God. When's the last time you spoke in tongues, preacher? This morning in prayer meeting here. Later on in my office at my house, I cannot go hardly a day without having the presence of God. I'll tell you what, what fellowship, what joy divine. Man, the fellowship of the Lord and let him minister. It comes when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. We need to have his presence. There's a lot of things going on out in the world that are in the church world, and we not get into that, but are not of God. They might look good, sound good, but they're not of God, church. We need the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen? To minister on to us and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the power and the presence of God that God will minister on to us. Now, this wasn't what I had planned in my message tonight, but I, I trust I've helped you some. You've got to get hungry. You've got to get hungry. My wife's great for leftovers. You open up our refrigerator sometimes, there's a little jar here and a little jar there and a little jar over here with stuff that for leftovers. I like leftovers occasionally, but I, can I confess to you, um, see, I'm before a crowd now so I can get bold. I, uh, I'm not a leftover fan. After once eating leftovers, give me the real stuff. <laughs> and with, what I'm trying to say is with the Lord, we cannot have leftovers. We've got to have the real thing. We've got to get a hold of God. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be Pentecostal. Be Pentecostal. And let God minister unto you. Get into the Word and pray. Get into the Word and seek God. Get into the Word and say, God, fill me. Fill me afresh and anew. Fill me with your presence and your power. Fill me with that precious anointing. Fill us with the Holy Ghost. Baptize us in your spirit. If you haven't been baptized, begin to pray for it. God will do it. God will fill you. And if you haven't spoken in a while, get alone with God and say, God, give me a fresh filling, a fresh anointing, the presence of God that you will Minister to me. Oh, how we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need that. You don't have to be filled with the Spirit to get to heaven, but you do need it, as far as I'm concerned, to walk with God. We need that power. We need that anointing that will minister unto us and breathe upon us that we can walk in victory in Jesus' name. Fill us with his presence. Fill us with his power. Fill us with his anointing. That when people leave the church, they'll say, I'm so glad to be in the presence of God. Glad to be in his presence. the living God. We need to have it. Let me close with this and I'll turn it over to the pastor. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're totally submerged in Christ. You'll have a love for the things of God. 
Your faith will be strong. Your prayer life will be different. Your life will change. You'll just be a changed person. God will do something in your life. We need to walk with that. We need to have that power and presence in our lives and be filled with God. Let us strive and hunger for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. May God minister unto us this next year. Should Jesus tarry another year, let it be a year where people get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. The song, the old song we used to sing, I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God. You want to see things happen? Just get a hold of God. Get into the Word. Pray. And I believe it will happen. Let me, one more thing, Pastor. What happens when you receive, when a Christian believer earnestly prays for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he wants to know he has received the same experience described in the book of Acts. God gave the same evidence now as he did then. Generally, the first outward evidence of speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives utterance. That is, you will be miraculously enabled to utter words in a language you have never learned. No one can tell you to speak in tongues. You hear me? Years ago when a lot of things were happening uh, in circles in Assembly God, in Pentecost and charismatic circles, there was a couple times that I received a letter about a seminar in a certain city, wherever, I don't know what the city was, but a city. And there were those there that said, come and we will teach you how to speak in tongues. I don't know if you ever got one of them or not, Pastor, but I did. Come and we'll teach you how to speak in tongues. You come up and somebody said they, they went to one or something. Anyways, I, I, of course, didn't go to them because it was a lie. But people went and came back and said, well, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, but their life hadn't changed. And they were told, you say, these, you say this after me, and you say, and so people would do that. That's what I was told. People would do that. Then the guy would say, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, that's not how it happens. You've got to pray. You've got to seek God. You've got to get alone with God and say, God, I want your spirit. I want your Holy Spirit. I want you to fill me with the spirit. And as the spirit gives utterance, He'll fill you. And you'll speak in an unknown tongue, known only between you and God. It'll happen. When you got filled with the Holy Spirit, no one told you. They might have told you to hang on or let go, but outside of that, you knew when you were filled with the Spirit, changed your life. You can't change. You, that's the only way you can be changed. So get a hold of God and pray and pray. And pray. Amen. Amen. I got to close. Amen. <laughs> I'll finish next. Praise God. And one thing I learned with the hold on, turn loose people is what they really meant was to hold on to what you're trying to get and let go of what's holding you back. And uh, the story that really stuck with me tonight was the fact that the move of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit transformed a church that was in bad shape. And we're not even in bad shape. So just imagine what God can do. So I just want you to spend a couple of minutes. Just come and join us together, and let's just seek them. Go ahead. Let me say that church that we pastored years ago, if you go to that town today and go on I-69, you'll go by a church that's up on a hill. It costs $3 million to build. They have three services on Sunday. Pastor thought when he built it, he wouldn't have to have only one. Ended up with three. God's still moving. Amen. And I looked on the missions board one day when we were there for a celebration. They support over 60 missionaries a month. But I, as I stood there, Pastor, can I, 
my mind went back to those days and see what God had wrought through the baptism, through the Holy Spirit in that church. And it's still, they've got a lot of people I don't know, of course, there. But they're still having a move of God. But it happened when people got filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. I'm glad to know there's another preacher just as bad at closing as I am. Amen. I'm going to ask you all to come forward just for a minute. And let's just seek God. What can he do through us if we let him? Hallelujah.